Vinny Politan, thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And more information, more theories about how he could have done it, the suspected Long Island serial killer. Where did he do it? I mean, the, the information at this point, you know, the, the bodies were recovered in one area, but where did the murders take place? Where, where does the evidence point in all of this, and how significant will that be at a trial? I mean, will prosecutors have to prove where and how all this happened? Or just connecting uh, the suspected killer to the bodies, will that be enough? And what sort of evidence is inside that house? Well, there are, are some folks who are talking that, listen, if, if, for this serial killer or any serial killer, murdering someone in your house may actually be a safer place as a murderer to do it, where less can go wrong. I want you to take a listen to John Miller, uh, who has studied this stuff. He's a former NYPD deputy commissioner, uh, terrorism expert. I mean, he's, he's, he's done a lot in his career and has some very specific um, theories and, and insight into all of this. He was interviewed by CNN. Take a listen. We've seen serial killers who have created operating environments in their home because it offers control and privacy. In this case, they don't know this, but why they suspect this is a strong possibility is two core reasons. Number one, tracking the victim's cell phones. They have three, well, they have the four cases he's a suspect and he's charged in three, but in three of those four cases, their cell phones seem to track from where they started out right to the Massapequa Park area of his home, and then they go dark. The other thing is, in all four of those cases, those were times when his wife and children were out of town, away from the house. Why do something in your own house where you're going to be creating evidence? Because it's the one place you have plenty of time to clean up that evidence. It's the place where what they call the murder kit, the things you're going to need to tie somebody up or do the rest of the things that are alleged in this case, are readily available to you. Um, it's where a victim is screaming, unlike a hotel room at 1.30 in the morning where people are going to hear that, um, can be muffled. And it's a place where, more important than all of that, you as the killer feel you are in control of the environment and the victim is not. So do they have a piece of physical evidence that ties any of these victims to his home yet? The answer is no. But they have removed a lot of things that they're going to be testing yeah. to see if they can tie um, either the victim's presence there or evidence uh, of the victim at that location. We have seen in the history of serial killer cases an innate ability to compartmentalize their normal lives, family lives, job lives, and then they're usually extraordinarily complex lives uh, where they operate in a hidden identity doing these things um, in a way to avoid detection. This case is like a lot of those. Right on point. Interesting, if you saw some of that footage from the search of the house, what is that big, huge, gray covered box with the red tape on it? Like, what is that that they're taking out of his house? And what does that house look like? And what, are there parts of that house where, yeah, this, like, what is that? I mean, it looks like it could almost be the size of a cage. You have no idea, but it, it's important enough that it's being removed from his house. And I'm wondering, were there parts of that house where it's like, hey, no one else goes down there, right? Mom doesn't go down there. The kids don't go down there. That's, that's dad's spot. Nobody goes down there. It, was there a part of the house like that? And was he keeping any sort of trophies from any of these uh, suspected murders inside the house or, or anywhere else? Let's bring in our think tank tonight to kind of talk about this a little bit. Joining us in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor, and the host of Diva Court Podcast, Marsha Mignot is with us. Also joining us in New York City, former senior homicide prosecutor, Bernarda Villalona, and also in Atlanta, Georgia, family law attorney, law professor at Emory University, Randy Kessler. Great to have everyone aboard. Uh, I'm going to start with Bernarda because uh, this happened in her backyard, not literally, but... <laughs> Not literally your backyard, but close by. So what are your thoughts here, Bernard, first about what type of evidence are they going to need? Like, they've got this connection, right? This, this 
this DNA connection from these hairs found in the burlap with the bodies, are they going to need a little bit more to tell a story to the jury to convince them about these murders, about perhaps where they took place? So, Vinny, so far what we know is that the case against Rex Huerman is very circumstantial. As you can see, they were executing search warrants at his home as well as at his property in South Carolina and also looking into his interactions in Vegas as well. But in terms of what they're looking for, they're looking to see where are the trophies? Is there any indication of where these homicides took place? Because as of now, we don't know. However, there is a sign in the sense of that it's possible that at least one of the homicides, the one having to deal with, uh, I believe it's Amber, Amber Costello, uh, probably took place somewhere outside of his home. And the reason why is because, remember, the day before her disappearance, there was a rule that took place, and it wasn't at the home of Hewerman. So that's how they got the identification. But still, we want to know where it happened. We want to know, are there any trophies? We want to know... How were these women actually selected? We want to know what was the cause of death. And a million dollar question also, how many other women are out there that this man killed? Marsha, I, I look at this case and it's, it's an old case. And, and we've been watching here on Court TV, some of the older cases, they become a little bit more difficult to prosecute, to, to put the pieces together. And I think of it this way, if it took so many years to solve something, does that give us some indication that, hey, maybe they don't have all the evidence they really need here? What are your thoughts about where they are right now with what at least has been made public? Well, what's made public is just circumstantial evidence so far. What the prosecution is definitely looking for is direct evidence. And despite the fact that they don't have direct evidence, remember, if you have enough circumstantial evidence, you can still get a conviction in this case. So I think what they're doing is gathering as much as they can to make sure that when they present it to the jurors, that they're not going to get a not guilty. Because if they leave it out there long enough and they can get the evidence, there's no statute of limitations on murder. You know, Randy, for me, a, a big part of this prosecution and what we saw happening with another accused serial killer down in Florida, down in Seminole County, the Seminole County killer, uh, the Seminole Heights killer, is that the judge there not letting it be tried as a, a serial killer. It's like one at a time. And to me, that's a completely different case in front of a jury. Like you, you go in front of a jury and you're saying, ladies and gentlemen, this guy's a serial killer four victims. I'm going to tell you about all the evidence connected. Right now it's three, but connected to three, four victims, whatever. Much different case in front of a jury. Right. Much more sympathetic to the jury, to the prosecution. You want to catch somebody who did something bad, but if you know he killed four people, maybe more, you really, you're four times as angry, four times more likely to try everything you can to find a conviction. Now you're supposed to find that he's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But people want closure. They want to find who did this. They want to end this madness, this unknowing for the families and for the victims. So if you can, you're absolutely right, Vinny. If you can string four of them together, that's better than one. One, maybe they got the wrong guy. Two, maybe they got the wrong guy. Three, four, come on now. You know, fool me once, fool me twice, et cetera. So you're absolutely right. Putting them together, much stronger for the prosecution. Yeah, I think it'd be tough for a jury to have, to look at evidence of three or four bodies with this man's DNA at the, at the death scene in the burlap where the bodies are wrapped and say, oh yeah, have a good day. We didn't, you know, hey, let's, let's, let's bring back in uh, those uh, uh, jurors uh, from Pinellas County, Florida to send them home. Different case. All right, now let's, let's talk about what Bernardo was talking about, which is, you know, this investigation now is, you know, they're looking at every place this guy's ever been. He has property down in South Carolina and, um, Aaliyah Bell, 18 years old, back in 2014, went missing from Rock Hill, South Carolina, um, just two days before Thanksgiving, less than a 30-minute drive from where the accused killer's brother lives in Chester, which is property which is owned by the accused killer. Uh, ABC is reporting um, that the Rock Hill Police Lieutenant has said, our investigators have been reviewing any information to see if there is a correlation between the disappearance of Aaliyah Bell and 
the suspected Long Island killer. So far, there is no indication that leads us to identify him as a suspect in this case. We will continue to investigate Bell's disappearance and follow up on all tips and leads. And, and I think, Bernard, the, the first place you would go in trying to connect him to anything else is to look for that pattern where he is not with his family. He is, he's either in South Carolina by himself or somewhere else by himself. And if, if he was in South Carolina, you know, a few days before Thanksgiving in 2014, without the wife and the kids, um, we may be onto something here. Absolutely. That's why it's so important when people try, law enforcement seeks to label a homicide, a killing as a serial killing, a serial killer, because number one, it gives you more resources. But number two, once you have it labeled as a serial killer, it opens up the net. Look how wide we're going, because now law enforcement is looking into any place that Rex Huberman has traveled, especially in places where he's traveled without his family. So now these different states are looking at cold cases where the females have been found bounded together or same similarities as the women that were killed in this case. That's another reason why, Benny, this case is going to remain as all three victims being tried in the same trial. Because in New York, he's being tried as murder in the first degree. And for murder in the first degree, and this is why the homicides aren't going to be separated, is if you kill two people, two or more people in separate transactions within a 24-month period with the same similar common plan or scheme. But now this is going to open up. I'm hoping to see a federal case because in New York, even if he found he's found guilty, the most he's facing in his life without the possibility of parole. We don't yeah. have the death penalty here. Yeah, You only have the death penalty on law and order. For some reason, they kept the death <laughs> penalty in that show and it was totally unrealistic. And federal cases. Yeah, but federal you can. Uh, Marshall Mignon, we're looking at these cases and you, you look at him, it looks like he was, you know, in his mid to late 40s when these women were killed. I've got to think there's a potential here. This guy could be a, if he is the one that did it, an extremely prolific killer. There, I mean, I could see dozens of other potential victims here just based upon the age at which he'll be, a, he was being accused of, of murdering these women. I don't think you start this career in your mid to late 40s? Well, the prosecution is gonna have to look at his history. You gotta go back to where was he living? What are the unsolved mysteries as it pertains to other murders in that jurisdiction? Where was he in that jurisdiction? If they can track him, they can definitely find out that he didn't start in his late 40s, that he may have started in his 30s or in his 20s, depending on where he went to college, depending on where he was living, if he's living in an apartment, all those things they have to look into if they're actually going to get to the bottom of all the individuals he may have killed. All right, Randy, I'm glad you're here tonight because his wife has filed for divorce. Surprise. Yeah. <laughs> How is that going to work? Uh, have you ever... Have you ever handled a case for a woman uh, getting divorced from uh, a serial, an accused serial killer? Well, not an accused serial killer, but we have spouses divorcing as soon as their husband is accused. Absolutely, right? George is no stranger to, to criminal cases, high profile criminal cases. And, you know, who wants to be around that? Even if their spouse is innocent, the negative attention, the karma, the stuff it does to the children, you know, separate, get through the criminal case. And if there's an acquittal, you can work on that in therapy. But absolutely happens very often that leads immediately to divorce because you don't want to be anywhere close to being a co-conspirator having any knowledge you want to show the whole world and your children this is not who i am this is not who you are child we are not part of this criminal endeavor even if there's an acquittal we're separating the children let's live our life if there's an acquittal then we work on the marriage if we want to but usually it's a yeah, it's a, it's a was... death knell to a marriage because uh, um, at a minimum he's like hanging out well let me ask you this, though, Randy. What if he becomes a little difficult, right, and, and doesn't, like, agree? Yeah, okay, give me the papers, I'll sign them. What if this, if this somehow becomes a contested type of thing, this divorce? Oh, well, give it to me, right? Let's stand in front of a judge and say, Judge, why don't you have a conversation with him? Because re really, there's not a lot to prove. You know, does he, he's not going to want to say anything, right? He's under criminal prosecution. He doesn't want to speak. He doesn't want to say anything that might make him look like a liar that could be used in the criminal case. And a lot of times we have these cases, Vinny, and the state wants to help us and the defense wants to work with us because we can take depositions, right? We can actually ask 
the defendant questions under oath about things that are relevant to the marriage, like, you know, did you have an affair? Did you bring other women into the home? Did you try to have, you know, sex with other women? So they want out as soon as possible. And if they don't want out and they think they're tough guys, they stand in front of a judge and I really don't have to say much. It's a conversation, that's to put it politely, between the judge and the perp. And I don't really have to do too much.